church family, this is it. The aircraft of our firefighter series has finally landed on the runway of completion. Today is the finale. Don't say all too much because the next series is going to be amazing. Our next sermon series is going to be entitled Symptoms. Because what God has been dealing with me for like the last two months Help my people understand they have been praying symptomatic prayers. Like you don't get deliverance from symptoms, you get deliverance from the cause. So the reason some of their prayers seem to go unanswered is because they're praying to me about the symptoms when I want to deal with the... That's the next series, symptoms. But on today, this is the finale of our firefighter sermon series. We have been in this series for nine weeks. Has it been blessing anybody? We have been in this series for nine weeks. And my prayer each and every Sunday, as I've had the grace to preach before you, is Holy Spirit, would you use this series to be likened unto a spiritual inferno? Light our souls on fire for the things of God. We want our hearts to be on fire for you. We want our homes to be on fire. We want our marriages to be on fire. We want our singleness to be on fire. We want our youth to be on fire where they can understand you can be young and unashamed. Set our hearts on fire. Even Lord, set our cravings on fire because you know that you have arrived to a place of spiritual maturity when you're not just praying to God for blessings, but you're praying to him for purging. God, burn up anything and everything in my life that's not like you, burn it. Any and everything that will cause for me to live in a season longer than I have to, burn it. Because this season was designed to be a season, not a state. And so if there's something in my life that needs to be burned, consume it. I want everything that you have for me, and I don't want nothing that you don't. Burn it. Burn it. This series not only has been designed to cause us to be Christ followers who are on fire for the things of God, but this word on today is going to show us that there are some things in your life that you must fire. Amen. Amen. See, I learned this kind of quick on my Christian journey. It took a while for other things, but this particular quality, I kind of grasped this one kind of quick. To get on fire, you must fire. Say it one more time. I learned this kind of quick in my Christian journey. As I'm getting discipled and learning how to follow Jesus, I learned this particular quality kind of fast. Jerry, to get on fire, You must fire. During your Christian journey, there must be some tenants that you evict. There must be some co-workers that you fire. We're going to do some firing and some evicting on today. Because to get on fire, you must fire. Because people cannot cross a line that you never drew. They can't cross the line that you have never drew. How about this year? Let it be clear, I'm sold out. This year, let it be clear, I don't tiptoe. This year, let it be clear, I am exercising purity. And purity is not just not having sex. Purity is resisting defilement. This year, I'm serious about my faith because to get on fire, you have to fire. In other words, you got to go. You got to go. You got not proper English. You must leave. (laughs) You must depart from thine presence. No, we're using Ebonics. You got to go. You got to go. Pride, you got to go. Arrogance, you got to go. Entitlement, you got to go. Overthinking, you got to go. Because evolution is tied to elimination. Talk, Holy Spirit. What are you wanting to evolve in but you don't want to eliminate? Evolution is tied to elimination. We're, send, we're sending out and handing out eviction notices on today. Some of us literally need to declare this. This eviction notice I hereby serve to every devil, 
every demon, every distraction, every counterfeit, every witch, every warlock, everything that is causing to myself to not experience the peace of God, you have to vacate the premises. Vacate the premise of my heart, vacate the premise of my soul, and failure to comply will result in the power of the Lamb. Will result in the power of the Holy Spirit because I don't work for you anymore. Can I get somebody to say as loud as you can, you're fired. You're fired. I don't work for you anymore. <laughs> I'm trying so hard to teach this, but Mr. Preach keep trying to rise up. If you want the fire of God. Sometimes this means in your personal life, there's things that you have to fire. Okay? Now watch this. God loves you and he loves me so much to where when you don't fire it, he will. You're calling it a breakup. I'm trying to give you a different perspective. God fired it. You're calling it rejection. I'm trying to give you a different perspective. God fired it. Because you've been praying for the fire of God. You sing during worship, I want to be tried by fire, purify. And God's like, okay, bet. <laughs> if you want fire, he'll fire for you. And I want to use this biblical narrative to corroborate my claim. In the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 1, if you're ready, shout, I'm ready. It says, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now, early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees, here we go. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the mist, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. I'm like, okay. Um, because <laughs> I really, remember I told you I was a student pastor for nine years. So I really try to understand some things in the text. I'm like, could you imagine one moment sensual pleasure? Then the next moment, you're snatched to public trauma. Just in an instant. We know what she was doing. We have a clip of her life. Ooh, this sounds just like 2024, doesn't it? Ready to stone people because of clips. <laughs> Let's keep reading the Bible, I'm sorry. Verse 5. Now Moses in the law commanded us that we should stone people who do this. It commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? Can we pause one more time? Because I got some questions. I, as I'm reading this text, there's so many questions that hit my mind. The first question is like, man, was she even dressed? Did she even have a chance to grab a sheet? Because she was caught in the very act. So did she have a chance to cover herself? Or is she exposed in front of this crowd? And just a few moments ago, she was in the hands of her luster. Not her lover, but she was in the hands of her luster. That's my first question. The second question is, where he at though? <laughs> where, where did he go? I really want to know, like, because after this whole scenario, if I was her, I would have a problem with him. Where did he go? Did he run? Did he try to get out? See, don't judge because some of us did the exact same thing, but we didn't get caught. Ooh, I have a sneaky suspicion that some of us had to climb out some windows before, go out some back doors before. Don't get quiet now. You just didn't get caught. But we judge people by clips. Clips. And we have a whole generation that will take a clip, sit down, and make a podcast about it. 
I'm like, okay, the Bible I read, uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, this is what Jesus says. Jesus says, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their flaw just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them. So the goal should be to win them to Christ, not gain followers. Like, what Bible y'all reading? Go to them. That's my first question. My second question. The third question is, what type of heart? These are scribes and Pharisees. These are pastors. What type of heart do you have? To drag somebody caught in an act and not even think about how you would feel. Like you know your conscience is smeared when you have done things and you're ready to stone. But that same stone would be thrown at you if you're behind the scenes everybody knew. Let me give you an acronym for stone. It is sinners that overlook their numerous flaws, numerous errors. So stone, sinners that overlook their numerous errors. Whenever you could post a stone, whenever you could criticize in stone form, it's proving I have a sinful heart and I'm overlooking my numerous errors. I think the last question that I have just from reading this text that was kind of funny was, were y'all listening, bro? Because she was caught in the act. Were you like outside the door? All right, she in here. Hey, Nicodemus, she in here now. Oh, yeah, he getting it. He getting it now. Come on, let's go. You got back door. Let's go. Were y'all listening? In the very act, I wonder, was this a pattern that they were aware of, and they were just trying to use this episode to trap Jesus? <laughs> this means it's not about people. It's about your position. Verse 6. This they said, speaking to Jesus, this they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, teacher, we caught her in the act of adultery. The law says we should stone her. Teacher, teacher, when they kept asking him, he raised up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. I really wonder, was he, what was he writing? Was he writing, I know he ain't talking. I knew what he did last night. I knew what this Pharisee did, and I know that. I just wondered. <laughs> what was he writing? He stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised up, raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Our clause of concern, our verse of emphasis that's really going to serve as the undertone for this afternoon's sermonic presentation lives in verse, 5, lives in verse 10 of our foundational text where Jesus asked her, Woman, where are they? Where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? You know what Jesus is doing here? Firing accusation. So good. Please don't miss it. He's firing judgment. He's firing hypocrisy. Because the same people that are about to stone you 
should be stoned themselves if we all knew everything from the pulpit to the pew if your deleted text messages could be projected on the screen if your dms could be projected on the screen your conversations your secret life what you googled and watched if it could be projected would you still have a stone he says that's fire and i want to speak around this thought from this subject for the finale of our firefighters series you're fired you're fired you're fired woman where are they where are the accusers has no one condemned you no one lord what jesus is doing watch this he's firing accusation and hiring grace he's firing judgment but hiring mercy see if you look at the text a little deeper in the gospel of john chapter 8 you will notice that there's these two sisters these these two twin sisters is what i like to call them because they both run in the same family they even look alike they both possess similar qualities, but no, they're not the same. <laughs> they're not the same. Now, don't get it twisted. They personify the amazing attributes and characteristics of the king of glory because the only reason that you and I are here right now, right. let me rephrase it. The only reason that you and I are still in the land of the living, yeah. the only reason that you and I are in the sacred sanctuary, the overflow, watching online, or will be listening to this via the podcast is because these two sisters behind the scenes have been persistently, tenaciously, and consistently at work in our lives, making sure what would ground our destiny stays off the runway. Hey. These, these two sisters. And if we be honest, for some of us, they've been working harder for you than for others. <laughs> because some people did the exact same things as we did. It's about to get real in here for about the next five minutes. Some people did the exact same things as we did. They drank the same drinks that we drank. They smoked the same joints that we smoked, committed the same crimes that we committed, because you do know lying on your taxes is illegal, right? Yeah. You, you do know driving under the influence is illegal, right? Yeah. You left that club and you were drunk, you were faded, tipsy, and you still drove irresponsibly. It's getting quiet right now. You do know selling drugs is illegal, right? Don't sit up in here front this afternoon. Some of us should be in jail. <laughs> Some of us should be in jail, but the only reason you didn't get caught, the only reason the bullet went another direction, the only reason that you and I are not in a cemetery somewhere, the only reason that you are still sane in the membrane is because these two sisters have been at work in your life and in my life. And if you didn't know it, these two sisters go by the name of Grace and Mercy. Grace and Mercy. Now, I, I, I really want us to explain this because if you look closely, you will see Sister Grace at work in the text. She got caught in the act of adultery. She is guilty. The law does say she's supposed to get stoned. She's caught in the act, and I really hope that you have humility to where you can see that this adulterous woman is me. And you can see that this adulterous woman is you representing an adulterous generation standing before a holy pure sovereign God and I got caught and maybe she's standing there naked or clothed I don't know she's standing there 
possibly waiting to hear the righteous judge slam down his gavel and say, I find the defendant guilty. But instead, grace steps in. Grace steps in. Now watch this. I'm like, okay, as I'm reading this, somebody got to pay for this. Because the wages of sin is death. So how can Jesus say go and sin no more? Who's going to pay for it? Jesus knows in just a few more days, I'm going to pay the penalty by hanging on an old rugged. Is anybody thankful that he caught the tab? Okay. All right. Let, let, Let me break it down a little more. He is saying, I'm going to catch the tab in just a few more days because I reversed the curse. We all got in trouble by what was hanging on a tree. I'm going to get you out of trouble by hanging on a tree. We all got in trouble by what we grabbed with our hands. I'm going to take nails in my hands so that nothing can ever take you out of my hands again. Once we sin, the ground produced thorns and thistles. On the cross, on his head, he has thorns and thistles, saying that I am the one who is going to have the power of life and of death. Grace is at work in this lady's life. So what could we call grace? What's the definition that we could give grace? I believe the best definition that we could give grace is grace is our divine attorney that keeps getting our case dismissed. (laughs) This is so good. Warren, if you just move this just for a second. Grace is our divine attorney that keeps getting our case dismissed. And nobody knows the horror of your case. (laughs) Nobody knows how dark how ugly the case is besides the Lord and even you. Grace dismissed the case. The reason you're still here is because grace dismissed the case. What made the bullet go another direction? Grace. What kept you from marrying that life wrecker? Grace. What has you still stable in your mind? Grace. What kept you from contracting that STD? Grace. See, it's going to get quiet now. It's going to get quiet because we got it twisted. The condom did not protect you. Grace protected you. And I'm not just talking about sexually transmitted diseases. I'm talking about spiritually transmitted devils. Grace protected you. The only reason I'm able to preach is by grace. The only reason that that cop didn't pull you over with that alcohol on your breath is grace. The reason that they didn't talk. See, see, it's getting quiet. Because some of us are tripping over what people said about you. I think we need to thank God for the mouths that he kept closed. You see that, right? Yeah. <laughs> if they really knew, I'm just thankful that some things he had never, he never allowed to go public. Some people did the same things as we did, but they didn't get the same grace as we did. It's grace. It's grace. It's grace that they left. Y'all to hear what I just said. It's grace that they left. It's grace. One of the worst things you could ever do is try to make yesterday people today people. Grace made them leave. Because I love you so much to when when you don't fire, I will. Grace. Now hear me. What we must do though is not confuse grace as getting by. Okay. See, see, it's going to be quiet now. I want to show you this in the text where we can see this. Romans chapter 6. Verse 1, what the Apostle Paul says, he says, okay, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that, what's that word? Grace may abound, certainly not. 
Grace. Grace. She is our divine attorney that keeps getting our case dismissed. Because to get on fire, you have to fire. And when you won't fire, I love you so much, I'll fire it for you. Grace. Now, Sister Mercy is a little different. <laughs> Sister Mercy is a little aggressive. Because she's in the field of blocking, stopping, and rerouting to ensure that packages with your address never get delivered. Yeah. <laughs> Did y'all hear what I just said? Yes. Grace. Amen. Make sure that packages with your address never gets delivered. Okay, I want to break it down a little more. When we look at this text, this woman deserves death. She committed the sin. She deserves judgment. This is why I say you have to see her as you. And I have to see her as me. Because please, oh, I'm going to get in trouble. Do not let these sugar-coated Western Hemisphere Christianity sermons make you walk around here thinking after all the hell I went through, I deserve. After everything I done went through, I deserve. After the storm I just came out of, I deserve. After 2023, I deserve. To pray to God, give me what I deserve, is to say, God, give me hell and death. What you deserve is hell and death. And a lot of our sermonic presentations, really in America, are causing for us to be entitled Christians. Like because you're pure, you think that you should get this. Because you're faithful, you think that you should get this. But if you read your Bible, it lets us know that's the reasonable service. That's the least you could do is present your body to God as a living sacrifice. You're not doing that to get a husband. You're doing that because grace and mercy stepped in on your behalf. So if I was a note taker, I'd write this down. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. So mercy, Sister Mercy, she's your attorney. She keeps getting your case dismissed. But, but Sister Mercy, she's involved in the mailing system. She makes sure that certain packages that you do deserve, they never locate you. Why? Because the blood covered you. The blood covered it. The blood covered it. The blood covered it. Y'all have to excuse me. I feel this. The blood covered it. The blood covered it. It couldn't find me because the blood covered it. Iniquities, the blood covered it. Past failures, the blood covered it. Failures, the blood covered it. Is there anybody thankful that your blood covered? Blood covered it. I want us to say this confession and everybody watching if you will put this in the room in all caps can I get us to say father, father I'm, so I'm so thankful for your grace and mercy, grace and mercy. The, only the only proper response is obedience and, obedience and worship one more time father, father I'm, so I'm so thankful for your grace and mercy, grace and mercy. The, only the only proper response is obedience and worship that's it. That's it. That's the only proper response. Everything else, you're fired. You don't give God glory, you're fired. I don't work for you anymore. You're fired. You're fired. And really, once we get under this new management, there's some benefits that we get. Can I give them to you? Number one, under this new management, you get a new name. A new name. We were once called unbelievers. We were once called adulterers. We were once called objects of wrath. First Peter chapter 2 verse 9 lets us know now 
that we're in Christ, what are we called? A chosen generation. What are we called? A royal priesthood. What are we called? A holy nation. What are we called? Special people. You have a new name. I was thinking about this. I had a dog before we moved. His name was Judah. That was my dog, literally. <laughs> and Judah was a German shepherd that he was such a protector. I, I mean, you remember that one time, T.C., we were walking him, and the kids were in front of us, and he was just pulling, just pulling T.C. And I've never seen him act like that. Because I'm like, I've, I've trained him. I mean, he's had his classes. But he wanted to be right next to my son and right next to my daughter, that trying to keep him back from where he could protect, he was throwing a fit. How is it a dog wants to stay close? Judah was so trained. You could open the gate, and he'd just look at me. Now, before Judah, we had this dog. It was a Labrador. If you open that gate, phew, he's gone. But Judah, somebody say a dog, dog. had enough sense, even though the door opens, master, I'm not going to go if you don't. A squirrel could run by. He wouldn't go. I want it, but if you don't give it, I'm going to stay. A dog. He, he had enough sense. I'm talking about a dog. Just because the gate is open doesn't mean go. And here we are, made and shaped in the likeness of God. And some doors can't open because if I open that, you're going to leave me. If you called him Toto, he wouldn't look at you. If you called him Lassie, he wouldn't look at you. If you called him Judah, he would acknowledge you but not go to you. How is it a dog knows his name but we don't? How is it a dog won't respond to what he's not? But we will respond to what we're not. To get a new name, a new, a new home, a new name. It's, it's almost like you got to learn to talk back to yourself. Just don't respond, but you can talk to yourself. <laughs> Where are my keys at? They put them upstairs. They show, that's crazy. <laughs> but sometimes you really do have to remind yourself. Listen, I want to teach you how to fight. Remember what God said about you, even when your circumstance is calling you something different. Because I, I have a new name. So when something tells you, you're not good enough, I got a new name. And it's called accepted. Amen. You're not pure, I got a new name. And it's called forgiven. Amen. Bro, you sinned entirely too much, I got a new name. And it's called redeemed. I have a new name. So you acting brand new, yeah, I got a new name. I'm a new creature. You forgot where you came from. No, I didn't forget it. I just refused to live where we met. Yeah. Have a new name. That's one benefit of being under new management. The second benefit of being under new management is you get a new story. You get a new story. A new story. And so many of us have given the pen to trauma. And you let it write the title of each season of your life. We let depression own the pen. Doubt own the pen. See, when it owns the pen, it can author the chapter. Once it authors the chapter, you read it and memorize the material. And so now you can be living out a story that's not his story. Is this making sense? So... There was this sign that was on, I believe it was North Carolina. It's, it's this Marine Corps air station in New River, North Carolina. There's a sign. And it says, pardon our noise. It's the sound of freedom. These news reporters were writing complaints about the sound of these F-16s that would fly over during a, it's nonstop. And people would get 
irritated. And so they decided, you know what we're going to do? At our military base, we're going to say, part not noise. It's the sound of freedom. So I, I just want to just remind hell and anybody who battles with believing that you have a new name, battles with believing that you have a new story, I want us to give God praise. And if it bothers somebody next to you, you might need to say, pardon the noise. It's the sound of freedom. So we give God praise that he gives us a new story, gives us a new name, and that Sister Mercy and Sister Grace has been active in your life. And the reason you're still here is not because you're so smart. It's not because of your degrees. It's not because of your accolades. It's because God saw it fit to allow us to remain here, part of our noise. It's the sound of freedom. This is why I worship the way I worship. Danny, this is why I praise the way I praise. Because I see this naked woman. That's me. I see her as Jerry standing before the court of public opinion. And they're ready to kill me because of what I've done. But Jesus steps in and fires every critic. All the guilt. All the shame. All the naysayers. Fires all of them. And it's just me and him. It's just me and him. Woman, where are they? Where are you, all of your accusers? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir. And I, I begin to read a little bit deeper. They knew that Jesus couldn't say stoner because the Romans didn't allow Jews to carry out their own executions. <clears throat> so if Jesus would have said, you're right, stone her, he would have been breaking Roman law. If he would have said, uh, don't stone her, they could have accused him of not keeping the law of Moses. So what do you do when people want to have sword fights? You remind them about themselves. Well, I don't think you should do this. And if I, I don't think you should ever go to church like that. What sermon you preached? Where are your disciples at? Who are you telling the gospel to? I understand there are a lot of people that you could point out wrong. Who's right? What church you go to? Who's your pastor? Where you get therapy from? You right, bro. You right. Who else is doing it right besides you? <laughs> they were using her as collateral damage of them trying to get people to stop looking to Jesus. Because ever since Jesus came on the scene, people stopped looking at the Pharisees, the teachers, the pastors, and start looking to Jesus. And what do a lot of pastors have problems with when you stop taking the focus off me? When you start getting people to read the Bible for themselves, they can see that I'm preaching heresy. When you get people to start knowing the word of God for themselves, they'll stop coming to my church. Why do you think the pandemic cleared out a lot of churches? It's because you're not saying nothing anyway. Sugar doesn't keep you in a hellish season. I need roots. I need doctrine. I need the word of God. How am I supposed to get through this crisis? My grandma has cancer. My children are strung out on crack. How am I supposed to get through? Don't just tell me it's my season. And if you have a need, sow a seed. I need to know Jesus for myself. And the same thing that was happening then is still happening today. We don't love Jesus, we love titles. We don't love people, we love crowds. This is why usually when people, ooh, I'm getting in trouble. Usually why we, when we join churches, the first place you want to get to is here. The last place you want to get to is behind the scenes. Talk Holy Spirit. Somebody say you're fired. <laughs> you're fired. You're fired. 
fired. You're fired. Okay, we can set it up now. Bree, come here real quick. I want us to get this. Because after he gives you a new name, he gives you a new story. Number three, he gives you a new nature. A new nature. This is when I'm still in flesh. Oh, this is so good. I'm still in flesh, but I'm not ruled by it. I don't know, some of us may not be there yet, but some of us possibly have gotten there. Have you gotten to a place to where you know your flesh about to go off and you just kind of laugh a little bit? Yeah. Anybody? You say, like, girl, if you would have came to me in 2015. <laughs> like, it shows growth because there was a time when it was just like, stop, get on time. It was, it was it. That was it. But now, it's almost like multiple choice happens. <laughs> Somebody cuts you off. Okay, hold up. Okay, you can A, be ignorant. You can B, speed up and catch her. You can C, lay on the horn. You can D, let it go. <laughs> that, new, that new nature is when now you have options. I want to help somebody who's struggling. You're not struggling because you're not saved. You're struggling because you are saved. And now the flesh and the spirit are at odds with one another. And whichever one you feed the most will win. This is why Sunday is not enough. If you only eat today and you don't eat again until next Sunday, all week long, everything's going to look appetizing. Yes. And so if you only feed your spirit for this 90-minute service, but you live with your flesh 24-7, you're always going to succumb to the works of the flesh. So I want us to write this down. Fire, who had the pen? Okay. Fire, who had the pen? So, Bree, you're going to be symbolic of my flesh. Come on this side. Who owns the pen? Who owns the pen? Because the Word lets us know that He's the author and the finisher of our faith. The author is the only one that has editorial rights. The author is the only one that could change periods to commas. Amen. So stop treating readers like authors. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. He is the author and finisher of our faith. He is the only one that has editorial rights, meaning he is the only one that can add a period, and he's the only one that can add a comma. Stop treating readers like authors. People who read your story can't edit it. They can't add a period to it. They can't add a comma to it. They are just readers. And this, this is the beauty of being in Christ. When doubt has the pen, just write doubt down. I had her write because she's a better writer than me. <laughs> when doubt owns the pen, the blood could just say, it's not you. Write worry. When worry owns the pen. See, I want you to, I want you to really get this. Because whatever owns the pen, when you look in the mirror, you see that too. So if you're insecure, when you're looking in the mirror, insecurity is looking back and talking to you. Does this make sense? When you doubt yourself, when you look at yourself, what do you see? Self-doubt. I want to help us with, to learn how to fight back. God says, okay, that's not you. And this right here, it, it really should, turn the page, Warren. This really should cause for everybody under the sound of my voice to have a praise in their heart. I want you to, you're going to have this pen now. You gave me this pen because now you're in Christ. You're not right no more. Amen. This, this is what should really cause for everybody to leave here with a different perspective. Revelation chapter 21, verse 27 says, nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose name 
are written in the Lamb's book of life. What's your name, sis? Desiree. Desiree. Spell it for us. Write Desiree's name down. D E S I R E E. Desiree. Okay. That's just one. What's your name, sir? Nick? Nick. You know how to spell Nick. Nick. <laughs> so this right here should matter more than who rejects Desiree. Wait, 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 listen, I need you to get this before you clap. More than who rejects Desiree, more whoever rejects or have something to say about Nick, who doesn't approve him, who, doesn't, who says they don't meet the qualifications, they should always remember their name is written in the Lamb's book of life. So on one day, when we stand before the Lord, nothing else will matter. We will be in a place where there's no need for the moon. There's no need for the stars. There's no need for the sun because his glory fills the temple. So whatever is bothering you, Desiree, you should rejoice because your name is written. Whatever has been bothering you, Nick, you should rejoice because your name is written. Is there anybody thankful that your name is I don't care how bad it is. He knows my name. And that to me is being well known. I don't care who knows Jerry's name. Does God know my name? He knows my name. Now the whole service is about to turn. To not be sure it's written. That's fear of the Lord. That's, that's what is terrifying to me. Depart from me. I never knew you. So watch this. If you don't fire it, oh, this is heavy. I got to say it. If you don't fire it and don't let me fire it, it will cause for you to be fired. I know we don't like to preach about judgment. I know we don't like to preach about hell. But the thing about Jerry, I'm going to preach all 66 books. All in the Old Testament. All in the New Testament. And I don't want us to come here and shout and rejoice and firefighters and, oh, church was great. Are you sure? That your name is written. How do I know? Okay, the basic part, we accept Christ as Lord and Savior. But here, here's, the, here's the clear part. Because I really, really, when I study this, many will say, Lord, didn't we do this? Didn't we do that? Didn't we do that? That's serving. What you can't fake is intimacy. I could come up here and preach and be going to hell. And you would never know because I have the gift. Somebody could come and sing and you have chills all up and down your back. Even the devil is the anointed cherubim. The solidifying factor. What do you do in your secret places? How often do you read the text? Without me saying turn to John 8. Do you know him? Do you know him? Because... I knew it was going to take a turn, and I said, God, I'm, I'm cool. I'm going to be obedient. I said, this is the whole point of you being on fire. You're on fire in the earth to represent me so that when you stand before me, it is written. Okay? Stop fighting back with your accomplishments and your success. That's not how you fight back. I modeled to you how to fight. When the devil was fighting me, I said, it is written. Men shall not live by bread alone. It is written, you can't fight fire if you don't get on fire. You can't fight the enemy if you aren't in the word. So all of this, all of this is to turn us back to the most important quality of our faith. Do you really have that relationship with him? What point is it? If 
I come up here, I'm sweating and I'm trying to get us to understand. I simplify it. I, I use props. I try to tell us about the gospel. I'm not preaching hard because I want attention. I'm passionate about this. Amen. I made a vow. If I can go hard when I was in the world, I'm going to go so much harder while I'm in the kingdom. And I'm going to give Jesus everything I have until I'm done Amen. or until he cracks the sky or takes me home. What about you, though? What about you? You are a byproduct of what you sit under. And each week you're going to get fire and it's going to burn you or ignite you. Most important point out of all of this, last point, your blood covered. That's, that's, that's what we shout about. That's what we're thankful about. That's what we're going to be talking about on resurrection. But I wanted to break this down to the lowest common denominator for whoever is stressed about a bill, about a relationship. This, this is what matters the most. This, when I'm looking and I'm trying to figure out, I mean, y'all, I'll be looking all over for buildings. I'm looking for land and buildings and build. And it was just like the Holy Spirit just reminded me this week, Jerry, this, the fact that I know you and grace has been your defense attorney shouldn't that keep your joy meter high your, your, your joy meter can I just be transparent y'all can have a seat I'm sorry can I be transparent I think I told uh, Torrance this I praying and asking God about this and eventually it's going to be a, a sermon but first I got to get it I don't ever preach revelation while I'm still trying to get it but it was so clear as I'm praying about the building. I'm praying. It's like, okay, either you don't read the Bible enough or you don't believe me. I take care of my bride. All you have to do is serve her and be grateful your name is written. My word says, listen, don't be afraid of men. But fear the one that has the power to throw you and your soul into hell. Yes. You worship me, you seek my face, and you be faithful with serving my bride. I take care of her. Tomorrow is my weight. You're not strong enough to bench press tomorrow. That's God's weight. He's the only one that can get under and lift it like it's nothing. Maybe you're struggling because you're trying to lift God's weight. Myself, I was reminded. Praise me that your name is written. Yes, praise Nothing else matters. So God, in this moment, we want to thank you for writing our names in the Lamb Book of Life. So many other things in this life can distract us, relationships, money, the news, the election, our health. But ultimately, God, our hearts should be filled with this simple gratitude that you saved us. So many times we come here trying to say, I need to hear a word. I need to hear a word. God, help us to be examples of the word. Help me. Thank you for helping me release that weight. We're supposed to be an army, not an audience. This is just our fiery furnace where we all get on fire so that when we go out into the world they can watch us burn for your glory forgive us for being so arrogant the prayerless man is the arrogant man forgive us for being entitled for thinking you we deserve this because of forgive us God and I pray that you cause for a hunger to get back in the hearts of your people a hunger not for things not for possessions not for not for increase but a hunger just for you a hunger for devotion help us to get lost in our prayer time instead of just looking at the clock and looking at our alarm help us get lost in your presence God that's what we desire more than anything in this life your presence Forgive us for not valuing your presence, but valuing people's opinion. It's 
not about a platform. It's not about a light, God. It's about representing you. In Jesus' name, we thank you for it. Amen.